and welcome to our very first episode of Cougars on Cougars. We're excited to be here. I'm Mary, this is Jess, and we're just going to get right into it um, with one of our segments that we're going to usually open with and call Talk of the Town. So what happened in BYU sports this week? Well, it was the best of times and the worst of times for the <laughs> BYU basketball team as they went on a road trip to the Pacific Northwest. We won a huge game against number number 25, Gonzaga, on Thursday night. Final score, 69-68 in favor of our Cougars. And then we traveled to Portland and laid an egg against one of the bottom teams in the WCC conference, <laughs> losing 84-81. So that improves our record to 4-2 and two in conference and 13-6 uh, overall. So coming up in a little bit, we'll break down the games with uh, Vanquish the Foe's senior basketball editor, Steve Pierce. In yeah. football news, BYU has officially welcomed three more coaches to their staff, so that's exciting. Mm-hmm. We've got a staff that we're building. Um, the first was the offensive line coach, who is Mike MP, and I believe he played at BYU. Um, and coached second, at BYU. And coached at BYU as a graduate assistant, and then he coached and here for a bit, right? Line, yep. Okay, um, yeah, didn't he recruit Jake Caressa? And anyway, he's great. We think he's a good hire. <laughs> um, yeah. Next is Steve Kafusi uh, for defensive line, and we know and love him. Um, Bronson Smash's father, who we have had on <laughs> staff for quite a while, and we are happy to be retaining someone. Um, third, we got a strength and conditioning coach to replace Frank Wintrick, and his name is Nu Tafisi. Uh, he comes from USC, so hopefully he will bring some of that really strong football culture um, to our Cougars. So we're excited about those three hires. Uh, The only other thing we wanted to mention with football is that recruiting is in full swing. Signing days on February 3rd. Um, We've seen pictures of Ty Detmer all over the place and Coach Sataki (laughs) and um, Coach Tui Akai just out on the recruiting trail with all sorts of uh, good-looking players. Yeah, so uh, get some big gets in yes, February. Yes, we're excited to see what they can do. So that's kind of what's going on with uh, basketball and football this week. Okay, so each week we're going to have a quote of the week. So we'll feature a quote from someone famous, maybe a coach, player. Or maybe we'll someone not famous. Maybe. It could be from one of your tweets. Look out. <laughs> yeah, it could be. So if you have suggestions for a quote that we should use on the show, maybe something related to what happened that week, send it to us at cougsoncougs at gmail.com. Tweet us. Tweet us, yeah. If you have a better idea for our segment, a better name, let us know. Yeah, we're still uh, on the fence about the name here, so (laughs) send us your creative ideas. Okay. This week's quote comes from media favorite Spurs (laughs) head coach Greg Popovich. Um, What Pop has to say is, basketball is a pretty simple game. What wins is consistency and competitiveness. Jess chose the quote this week, so I'll, I'll let her explain why she chose that one, Jess. Yeah. What? Consistency? Well, <laughs> and competitiveness. I feel like it fits because that seems to be the, the biggest problem our basketball team has seen. I mean, one of the big ones. As a fan this <laughs> season, we've had such big games where we're like, this is amazing, we're going to go all the way, and then the yeah. next game we will just play terrible defense, defense and lose to a team that we probably shouldn't. And it's been frustrating, right? Yes. And, and the coaches and the players have mentioned that, too. They know that they need to be more consistent. And it's something they're working on. We just haven't seen it yet. Yeah. I mean, this week was a great example where you had a great game at, at Gonzaga, played great defense, and then you go to Portland and give up 84 points and lose to a not great team. Yeah, and that's what I was going to say. I think a key to being consistent um, is in your defense. You're not always going to be hot. Chase Fisher isn't always going to shoot um, nine three-pointers. And, uh, you know, even Zach Selyus has off nights, as we saw for the first time on the Pacific Northwest uh, road trip. But um, I I know that the team is working on defense, but I think that if we can root ourselves in defensive consistency, then we will see some more wins. And I think think competitiveness, too. I mean, we saw that this weekend when things weren't going well. That's what kept us in the game. I yeah. mean, talk about Nate Austin. Will to and, win. I would say yeah. more than anything at Gonzaga, our will to win <laughs> exactly. kept us in it. So yeah, um, and, and hustle plays, you know, from Nate Austin and some mm-hmm. of the other guys come in, make these huge plays, and, and good things happen. So Yeah. Yep, I would agree. So thank you uh, to Pop for that inspirational quote. Okay, our next segment is called Coaching from the Couch, um, which we all do. We definitely do it. You can catch us live tweeting during most games. So during this segment, we are going to try and stick with one thing that went wrong and one thing that went right. 
from each game. So Jess is going to start with what went right at Gonzaga. I think you can refer to me as Coach Tyler in this segment. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> Coach Tyler, please. All right, for Gonzaga, I think the obvious one is defense. Yes. I mean, we, we held those Zags to um, 36% overall shooting, but 48% was Kyle Wilcher on his own, had 35 points. The rest of the team, 29%. So we, we kind of took a gamble, let Kyle Wilcher try to beat us on his own, and he couldn't. The rest of his team couldn't contribute. Yes, and I will address what went wrong against the Zags. Um, obviously, as you could guess, three-point shooting was abysmal. Three out of 17 shots, which is a whopping 17%. We had three three-pointers. They all came in the second half. About it was not minutes good. left. So I know yeah. that it's rough when you're on the road, but <laughs> three for 17 is just not ever going to cut it. So, except for it did that game, amazing. Okay, <laughs> it did. It did by one with one point to spare point because left. we were playing good defense. Anyway, That's okay. True. So there's Gonzaga. Next, uh, let's talk about what went right against Portland. Um, that's me, and it was really kind of hard to pick something, but when I thought about it, Nate Austin came to mind, and I don't know if he just got some sort of crazy high off that amazing block in the Gonzaga game, but yeah. he looked kind of like a different player against Portland, and he was. He's always been really energetic, but this time I felt like it was energy actually was mixed so with active. talent. Mm -hmm. uh, he was going after every 50-50 ball. He was getting all sorts of offensive rebounds, which didn't matter because we couldn't score <laughs> off of them. But I really liked the way that he played and played in the energy that he brought to the court. So and I would he, say that was a bright spot. And he had seven points in that game too, which is yeah. above average Post scoring! I know. So what went wrong about Portland? I think there's a lot of <laughs> things we could point out. Picking one was difficult. Right. The obvious one for me is free throw shooting. Yes. We missed seven. Seven? Eight. Eight. I think we were 21 for 21, 29. 29. Yeah. Eight points from the line, and we lose by three. Yes. So just to, just to clarify that, we lost by three points, and we missed eight free throws. There's some basic math for you. Yeah. I mean, that's just leaving points on the floor. You know, it's called a charity stripe for a reason. That should be easy easy buckets. but And, and it was kind of spread around. <laughs> Pretty much everybody missed a couple. Some free throws. So. so clean it up. Our next segment is called Cougs in the Classroom. So in this segment, we're going to break down some of the basketball rules or football rules, whatever sports in season. So today we're talking about traveling, which is sort of relevant to both games that we played this weekend. Sort of. <laughs> um, there were a couple botched calls. Uh, the one that stuck out to me was... Thankfully, it didn't lose us the game, but it potentially could have lost us the game against Gonzaga in the last second, uh, where Kyle Collinsworth won the ball and fell hard on his butt, which is, in fact, not traveling. So that was one of two pretty bad traveling calls that we thought Jess is going to talk about. The other one that did maybe cost us the game. It's not the only thing that cost us the game. Definitely We're not, not blaming the refs. But it was still a, a missed call that yeah. hurt. We get it. Refs don't decide the game and all that. But we're fans, and we get to complain about stuff like that. So we're and going it to. it makes us feel better. Okay, so according to the rule book, it says, after coming to a stop and establishing the pivot foot, like Alec Wintering did at mm -hmm. the end of the game, mm -hmm. when he was being trapped by Chase Fisher and Nick Emery, mm -hmm. the pivot foot may be lifted but not returned to the playing court before the ball is released on a pass or a try for a goal. So if you go back and watch that. He maybe lifts it a few times, it feel, feels like. A few times, but yeah. not a travel. It's fine. Yeah. Whatever. Not in this league. We're over it. WCC refs. I'm sure we get to do this a lot with the type of league we're in and the type of refs we yes. have. Yes, Coog's in the classroom where we take the refs and maybe some other people to school. Okay, now we are going to talk mm -hmm. about our basketball crushes. Or we have another word for that, which is admirers admirers um to be clear when we say basketball crushes we don't mean it in a girly way we mean it and we have a crush on their basketball game it doesn't just apply to girls man i think crush boys have a you can have a man crush so it's fine we all have someone's game who we admire uh, particularly i think and it was really hard for us to pick just one because i think that depending on the game we have a crush change. on a different player uh but when it came down to it i picked kyle collinsworth as mine because how can you not have a crush on filling up the stat sheet like that it is just a thing of beauty he's everywhere when he took over in the gonzaga game down the stretch there beautiful beautiful every byu fan should have a crush on that 
Nine triple doubles is hard to argue with. But I will argue because I think mine is Chase Fisher. <laughs> I won't argue with you there. Right? There's a lot of arguing and not arguing I going mean, on. The way Chase can light up the three-point line yes. is amazing. I mean, remember that Chaminade game? Yes. Ten? Yes. Nine and a half? And this year's version of it, in fact, was also yeah, it, quite beautiful. Yeah. I'm, and then even this weekend, I mean, with how he played, just driving the, the paint, game. how aggressive he was. Yeah. I mean, he, you can tell he does not want to lose, and he found ways to contribute even when the three-point wasn't falling. Yeah, when he gets fired up, it is very easy to have a basketball crush on Mr. Chase Fisher. For sure. Speaking of <laughs> Mr. Chase Fisher, uh, we felt it appropriate that we talk about uh, our little fan club that you may or may not have heard of, and uh, Jess is going to tell you how that came about. So back in October, Chase was on Beery Sports Nation, which we watch every day. I'm sure a lot of you do, too. And they had Chase on, so I was excited about it. I love hearing his accent. He's got a great face. I'm not going <laughs> to complain about it, right? No. Anyway, in no. addition to his game, whatever. So he was on, so I just tweeted out how excited I was about it. Yes, and unbeknownst to me, I also tweeted about how yeah. excited I was about it. There may have been a few hard eyes emoji thrown Not. in there. Either Anyway. So we're watching, and of course, they read our tweets to Chase. Of course. And so Chase is like, Hold on a second. Starts getting a little have defensive. To tell you that I'm married. Well, not really, but basically is what he said. Yes. He calls his girlfriend his wife. It's a really interesting anyway. Anyway, so Jerem's like, well, there she's married. They're married. And he's like, oh, well, that's fine then. That's we're just fine admirers. Then. Yep, we're just admirers. So so came to be <laughs> the married people who admire Chase Fisher Club. It is somewhat exclusive. We're sorry if you're not married and want to join. But, but Chase only appreciates married admirers. So <laughs> yep. We do have a member of our club joining us now, though, all the way from Washington, D.C. It's Steve Pierce. Okay, so on the show right now, we have Steve Pierce, who is the senior basketball editor for Vanquish the Foe. How's it going, Steve? Very, very good, ladies. How are you? Congratulations on your new show. Thank you. It Thank is you appropriate are. that we are having Steve on, as he is the creative genius behind our show's title so thank you for that while we have you here well you know it was it was the least i could do to help you uh inaugurate this fine venture <laughs> well thank you okay so you're joining us when we are talking about basketball crushes in that we have a crush on their basketball game is that um, all so we know me and jess know who your all-time basketball crush is so why don't you uh, talk to us for a minute about him we'll indulge you Oh, well, it has to be, it has to be, if you know me at all, it's, it's Matt Carlino, the, the, the patron, the pa I'm the patron saint of left-handed volume shooters. And, uh, you know, I have, a, I have a new flame in Nick Emery, who is, you know, chucking it often from deep with that left hand. But my, my heart will really always belong to, uh, to one Matthew Mario Car Carlino. May he, may he rest wow. in peace. Well, I think that he and probably his mother thank you for that. I don't know about the rest of the BYU fan base, but whatever. So we heard mention of Nick Emery, and I can definitely see the <laughs> comparison that you're drawing there. So would you say that Nick is uh, this year's proponent for your basketball crush? Uh, I think overall, uh, I really like Nick. I love Nick's game. I think Nick's going to be a really great player for BYU for a lot of years. I'm really excited to watch him. But... And so, yes, like there's, there's, there's certainly a, a basketball crush going on there. But I also have this, this thing for Zach Selyus' jump shot. His Ooh. form is, is, yes. is, a, is a little sexy to me, <laughs> Pure uh, frankly. Pure pure, I think. It really is. I'm not sure it's... if there's a word good enough for it. Okay, mm -hmm. so Nick and then Zach. So those are this year. Okay, so basketball crushes aside, I think Jess has uh, some other questions for you. I do. Okay, so we got to talk about Gonzaga. So, Steve, maybe you can tell us, how on earth did BYU win that game shooting 17% from the three-point line? Ugh, still well, that was, that was a weird game, guys. That was super bizarre. And my dad texted me at the end of the game, and I, I actually hadn't finished. I was watching on delay, and I get this text from him, and it's like, how did that just happen? And I was like, I, I didn't know if that was like a really good thing, like we won, or that was like we just lost in like Della the Dagger heartbreaking fact again. <laughs> and so I was, then I was like super nervous. <laughs> and so then we ended up winning, obviously, and I understood what he meant. Um, but I really didn't know what to tell him because like we shot 17% from three. 
Uh, it, we gave up 35 points to Kyle Wilcher. It was kind of a kind of a mess in a lot of ways. But the reason that BYU won, or the big reason at least, there's a, there's a couple reasons. I mean, Chase Fisher was awesome. He got to the hoop. He didn't settle for for jump shots. Kyle Collinsworth put the team on his back. Nate Austin was huge, particularly in the final minute. But the one reason why BYU won is because they took a gamble defensively. And I wrote about this at Vanquish the Foe. Uh, they did not, they resisted the impulse to double Kyle Wilcher and essentially stayed home on all of Gonzaga's other players and dared Wilcher essentially to beat him single handedly. And Wilcher obviously got a lot of points, uh, but it really helped them to stay home on Gonzaga's other players. They didn't have wild, uncontrolled closeouts like they normally do, uh, which allowed them to keep their defensive shell really tight. Uh, kept kept Gonzaga out of the paint, only gave up 20 points in the paint, which is the most since uh, the first game of the season against UVU. Uh, and really, it was their best defensive effort of the season, which you know obviously they weren't able to replicate at Portland. Uh, but it was it was it was a fun game, and it was really great to see them uh, and and show that they can do that, even if they don't do it all the time. Right. So with that game, we beat Gonzaga. Every fan is on a high, and then we go into Portland and we tank. Yeah, so you tweeted uh, after the game that that's what you call a really bad loss. <laughs> so it's a really, question. really, really, really bad loss. <laughs> I liked the tweet that I saw too where you said that we were doing the trap, which was working, and then we just stopped. So I'm not sure. It looks like the d- defense at Gonzaga was unfortunately the exception and not the rule. Um, but I think that you would agree with us in saying that that loss at Portland does negate almost entirely negates what we did at Gonzaga. I mean, yes, it's a top 100 RPI win, but when all is said and done, you win against Gonzaga, you drop one against Portland. Just let's end with uh, what that means for us NCAA tournament-wise. It's it's bad. It's really bad, guys. I'm not going to sugarcoat it for you. It's really bad. Before the, por- before the Gonzaga game, BYU had three losses left. Uh, on the season if they wanted to get to 26 wins, which is basically safe territory for getting into the tournament as an at-large. Uh, the Gonzaga win was huge, top 100 win, like you mentioned, huge win over a top opponent uh, on the road, something that BYU hadn't had yet. Uh, and then they went and just absolutely threw it all away in Portland. And now they're down to, they've got two losses left. That's not to say that it can't happen. It can happen. It's just not very likely, particularly, I'm not particularly confident after watching them just literally put up a stinker in Portland against a, Portland is not good. They are a bad basketball right. team. And so, you know, they've got a lot of other games against better basketball teams than Portland. And so I'm not particularly confident at this point that they're not going to lose another game to another bad team. I mean, they still have to play St. Mary's again. They still have to play Gonzaga again. They still have to play Santa Clara again, USF. All these teams are better than Portland. And, and so they've Pepperdine, got, they've got two wins Pepperdine, left. And who's also pretty dangerous, and that's this week. So we may see uh, one of those two losses come this week. Let's hope not. Fingers crossed. <laughs> Fingers crossed. But, yeah, it's, it's going to be a tough, tough road to hoe. Um, it can happen. Will it happen? Probably not. They're probably going to have to win the WCC tournament, which they're capable of doing. There's a lot of talent. Yeah. Uh, but it's going to be it's a tough road to hoe, and they got to learn how to play consistent before then. Well, Steve, on that hopeful note of we might win the WCC tournament, <laughs> we will leave you. Thank you for joining us. No problem. Best Thank of luck, you. girls. Thank- All right. Up next, BYU plays at Loyola Marymount on Thursday night at 9 p.m. Mountain and then at Pepperdine Saturday at 6 p.m. Mountain. I will be in Southern California for both of those games. Which I kind of hate you for. I'm not going to apologize for it. (laughs) So if you'll be at those games, come say hi. I'd love to meet some of you fans that are based in the Southern California area. Yeah, or aren't and are just in town. Interact with Jess, get some pictures with her. We'd love to see him. This week's episode of Cougars on Cougars was brought to you by the dirtiest player in the NBA, Matthew Dellavedova. May you always stay loyal to the white and blue. For Jess, I'm Mary. See you next time.